Okay. So I'm here to tell you new tales of wireless input devices. I am Gerd Klostermeyer. I'm an IT security consultant slash pen tester, and I'm pretty much interested in embedded systems and wireless technologies. So uh, wireless input devices is a very good starting point for me. This is my dear colleague Matthias Deeg, who cannot be with me here with me here, unfortunately, for today. But whenever I'm talking about we, I mean this is a group effort. Most uh, huge parts of the research was done by him. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I will give you a short introduction of what we analyzed and what we used to analyze it. Some, some review about the work of other researchers before us, some overview of our actually research, the found security vulnerabilities, hopefully some live demos and some conclusion and recommendation if we still have time left, some, some anecdotes that might be interesting. So what do I mean when I talk wireless about wireless input devices? Basically, most important one is the keyboard. I, some of you maybe have a keyboard at home or at work that is wirelessly. There are wireless mice and wireless presenters are also very commonly used for presentations. When I talk about use technology from the attacker perspective or from the analyst, analysis perspective, um, it's stuff like the hack of one, a software defined radio. So a universal device that I can program to send and receive data packets however I want, or a crazy radio that has a very commonly used chip on it, or even the Logitech unifying receiver. Um, it is possible to reprogram that receiver to use it as an analysis or a tech tool for some keyboards. So this is the previous work of other researchers. It, well, hacking wireless input devices is pretty pretty old, actually nearly 10 years. Um, some people did some presentations about it, but the bad part is until today it's well, pretty much broken. F um, in 2016, um, third from, from below, you can see of mice and keyboards. Um, my colleague Matthias Deeg was here 2016 on the Hackloo and presented some re research we had so far on encrypted keyboards. And this is here now a pretty much, that's why it's called New Tales, a, a follow-up project because we want to know more about uh, these wireless input devices. And in 2019, other researchers uh, researched this area as well. So we have Marcus Mengs or Mark Newlin who looked at presentation clickers or Logitech devices as well. As I said, follow-up project, well, because we had a lot of open questions that were not answered so far, and uh, we want to set a different focus point. Uh, in the first research project, we looked a lot at the keyboards, but not at the wireless presenters that are becoming very famous lately. So just to recap, from 2016, that were five keyboards that advertised themselves as being super secure, AES encryption and whatever. And as you can see on the Fujitsu one, the second from above, there are a lot of question marks left um, because we hadn't the time to look into it closer because it has a different chip and we want to do that with this research project because, well, basically we want to do keystroke injection attacks attack the computer where the receiver dongle is plugged into, even though the keyboard is encrypted. So what we did for this project, some more keyboards that were still on the list, and a lot of presenters we wanted to know more about. Just to give you a better understanding of um, our approach, how we analyze these devices, we did First of all, there's something like the, the hardware analysis. So we did not have any cooperation at this point. We just got on Amazon, bought some of the popular presenters and keyboards. And when they arrived, um, we opened them up. We stare at the PCB. We identify maybe some chip markings, Google for the data sheets, read the data sheets. And if we find nothing, we still can, well, try tracing some, some wire tapping, some, 
some traces on the PCB to get more information about the chips. Apart from the hardware analysis, of course, there's the radio-based analysis, so everything that's going over the air. You can use a software-defined radio for that, like the Hacker F1. Oh, at least we did. Um, you can use software like the Universal Radio Hacker, GNU Radio, and Spectrum, something like this, to, to get a better understanding of how the package might work. And you can use tools like the Crazy Radio with the NF Research Firmware, because the Crazy Radio is basically just a small device with the same chip on it like a lot of keyboards have, or some of the presenters have. Um, so it's pretty easy to implement um, stuff on, on that device. And last but not least, there's the firmware analysis. Well, we can open up some of the devices, and if the chips are not protected against readout, maybe we can solder some wires on them and read out the firmware, maybe the key material, um, and get a better understanding from that. We did not actually do that in this research project. In, in 2016, we did that on a lot of keyboards. It worked pretty well. But for the presenters and the newer keyboards we tested, it was just not needed to achieve our goals. So let's start with the hardware analysis. So this is what a basic presenter might look like. It's a Logitech R700, pretty famous, like the R400. And if you ever use something like this, you might have noticed that you don't need any driver or special software to get them to work. And that's because the dongle is basically just a keyboard, that a USB keyboard. And if you press the next slide or previous slide on the presenter, it's just pressing the page up on page down key. For most presentation programs, that's well, move to the next slide or go back to the previous slide. Some presenters use the arrow keys, but it's the same principle. Some have some more keys, but that's not very interesting so far. Well, as I said, first approach will open up the devices to understand what's going on in there. And we did that. Well, this is an inner tech presenter. I'm not sure how familiar you are with these devices. They come in different form factors, so this is just a small one you can put on your finger and it's really easy to handle and um, quite neat. And as you can see on the on the right image, um, you can read chip markings. Well, we can Google for the data sheets for this one. This is another presenter, uh, the R400. Um, as you can see, there's a... Well, I don't know if you remembered the chip markings, but this is a totally different chip. So might work completely different. Even another chip on the Argus presenter, and sometimes it gets really worse. This is uh, uh, pictures of the Kensington presenters. They use a two-chip setup. Um, there's a main microcontroller for for yeah, preparing the packages, getting the key inputs, and there's an, an RF transceiver chip sending the actual packets over the air, and they communicate together. And as you can see in the right picture, we soldered some wires on the PCB traces to to understand what they talk each other, and maybe from that understand what chip is underneath that epoxy blob. Same for the Fujitsu keyboard LX390. Uh, same approach, just listen to it and hopefully we find out what it's underneath. And we were successful. This is just as an overview, as you can see in the RFIC column, we identified lots of different chipsets used in these devices. And for each chipset, uh, you basically have to start a new research project because the chips might work completely different like the chip before. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we read the data sheets if they are publicly available and then read them again. And after that, maybe one more time or another time because there's always something you miss on them and they are really helpful to understand what the chips are actually doing. And for the NF24 or the Cypress chips, they are publicly available and they're still popular in a lot of the, the devices. And sometimes you are lucky like the Bacon chips because the Bacon chips were not that hard for us to understand because they are almost identical to the NF24 chips. So you don't have to start at zero again. 
And for some chips, well, it's, it's hard for the HS304. Uh, we didn't find any data sheet publicly available. Well, luckily, Mark Newlin did reverse engineer some stuff about that uh, chip and published it on GitHub, so this helped us a bit. Radio-based analysis. This is just well, a screenshot of the Universal Radio Hacker, a great tool to use with a software-defined radio. It helps you to, to do the basic analysis of, of the package um, that you capture over the air. And it's capable of sending as well, so you can send your own packages after you craft them with the tool. But it's not that easy. Well, I'm not sure if you ever tried to work with a software defined radio. It's, there are quite a few challenges to get to the point where you actually want to be to reverse engineer what is going over the air. And first of all, there's this, um, and it is already um, FSK demodulated, so you can get a bit of understanding what might going on, let's say the parts that are above the line are, well, the ones and the ones are around zero, so you might go from there are just some waves in the air to ones and zeros, but still, if you're ones and zeros, you're well, a long way from understanding when I press an A on my keyboard, how are the ones and zeros generated? So there are a few challenges. Uh, first of all, signal modulation, there's the packet format framing, there are different length fields, there are byte orders, bit orders, sometimes they are reversed. All protocols we analyzed have some sort of checksum that is differently computed. We have the actual payload you're looking for, so um, we want to press our own keys, or if we want to sniff on the communication, we need to understand where the payload is. And there are different challenges like frequency hopping. Some of the devices change their channel, and you have to understand that. And even worse, at least for this project, we came across data widening. Never had that before. Um, this is just a technique to make the signal more reliable. So before you send your actual data, you XOR it with a scrambling sequence. So this is basically an encryption, if you don't know the scrambling sequence, um, and that's, well, something we had to deal with because we need to know the data whitening sequence, the scramble sequence, to undo that operation and to understand what data is in there. Luckily for most chips, this is documented somewhere in the data sheet. Um, the package are actually not that different each time. So most of them, they start, uh, up, even for different chips, they start with a preamble, they have some kind of sync word, then there's an address field. Of course, you don't want to interfere with the, maybe your neighbor board, the same keyboard as you board, and you don't want to interfere with it, so they have different addresses. Um, some control information for the, for the connection flow sometimes, and of course the payload and the checksum. So uh, with the data sheet, we were able, at least for the beacon chip and for the others as well, as long as we want to inject our own keystrokes, we have to understand it, and so we put a lot of time into that. And this is what the ones and zeros from before can look like once you understand everything. So there's the preamble, there's the address, you know where the payload length is, and most importantly, the actual payload. So where is the keys that were pressed on the keyboard on the presenter or something like this, and where's the CRC checksum. So once we understand everything from this, we can go to the next step. Now we know how the packets look like, have to look like, and we can try to craft our own package. And first of all, there's a, a pretty obvious one, and we've talked about that in 2016 as well, that's mouse spoofing, because most of the, well, no, all of the uh, desktop sets that we checked, um, the uh, connection of the mouse to the dongle was not encrypted. And this is true for, for presenters as well, because there are some presenters out there, they have a small touchpad on them, so you can control the mouse 
so you can point on something in your in your presentation. Uh, as it turned out, there is they are unencrypted and unauthenticated as well, like the mice, the the communication of the presenters. Mice implementation is also flawed, and we can yeah do mouse spoofing. This is somehow old and busted, but but still kind of funny. So I will show it anyway. Um, this is just a small demo video we did some while ago. Um, you can argue hmm, what is the importance of encrypting uh, mice, but we wrote a tool just to demonstrate that you can actually do something um, with when you have control over a mouse that is at least on an unlocked screen. And the approach is well, just try and error. Of course, we need a keyboard, but um, all Windows systems have a keyboard that you can control with the mouse, and we'll we just search for it. We don't have a back channel, but if we press a wrong application, doesn't matter. The on-screen keyboard will always up appear on the top. And there are some other helpful things like um, the mouse movements, for example, are resolution independent, so it's not that hard. Or even if you never use the on-screen keyboard, it always appears 100 pixel from top and 100 pixel from left. So there are some yeah, assumptions you can make that makes the attack more reliable. And, well, this is just typing some some PowerShell download and execute command, just for demonstration that you can control uh, a remote computer just by controlling controlling the mice. Well, it's not that interesting. It's just a demo exploit, like some some ransomware. You have to pay some money. So maybe a little bit more interesting, replay attacks. Replay attacks, well, at least for keyboards, they are pretty pretty interesting. If we can can capture you entering the password at the beginning of the morning, well, maybe come to the office and the first thing the your computer asks of you, at least in most cases, is uh, username and password if you boot them up. And when we can just record the signals and replay the signals, well, I don't know what uh, you type, maybe the keyboard is encrypted or something like this, but if I can record the signal and replay it later on, I can unlock your screen. So um, I record you um, unlocking your screen and later on you go to a coffee break or something like this. And when you lock your screen, I can just replay the recorded unlock sequence, and it will unlock your the, um, unlock your your computer. And this is true actually for all keyboards we tested, and for all wireless presenters as well. Um, for presenters, the main focus was on presenters. It's not that not that interesting. Well, because what can we do with a recorded uh, presenter signal? They're basically just next slide and previous slide and next and next slide or something like this in the sequence. And if we record this and replay it, well, we're we'll just basically pressing page up and page down buttons on, on the target device. Uh, I'm not sure if you can actually compromise a device just by pressing these two buttons. But so we did not focus more on that. Well, we, we tried and it worked for every, every presenter worked for the keyboards. We checked that for the keyboards in 2016 as well. The, the presentation is online. If you want to have a look, um, we, we built a demo device that can unlock the screen, just a handheld Raspberry Pi or something like this to demonstrate that. More interestingly are the keystroke injection attacks. So are we able to uh, inject keystrokes to the target device? The target device is the device where the, the dongle from the presenter or the keyboard is put into. Can we take over this computer by injecting well, any keyboard commands that we want? And turns out, well, at least for most of the presenters, this works pretty well. Um, the communication of the presenters are 
also is unencrypted and is unauthenticated. So I can well spoof the the presenter. I can pretend to be the presenter myself and send keystrokes to the target device by knowing the package format. We have had a look previously. So. What happens if the receiving dongle does not, well, let's whitelist or checks the keys that is, that are coming from the presenter. Of course, the presenter does have only the next slide and previous slide buttons, but if we, as an attacker, let's say press an A key or a B or C or the Windows key or something like this, will the, the dongle that is basically a USB keyboard still enter these keystrokes? Or is there some whitelisting in place? And turns out, at least apart from two of them, all uh, implement a full keyboard, and we can perform keystrokes in the way we ever want to. I will try this live. Let's see. Um, all of these devices are on 2.4 gigahertz. And if you have looked at your smartphone, there are a lot of wireless LANs around here and Bluetooth communication is also 2.4 gigahertz. So let's see if this demo works. Um, on my um, um, victim system, this is the one you can see here, uh, I just inserted the dongle of the, the ring presenter we had a look at. And on my attacking system, I plugged in the, the crazy radio dongle. So. I can unplug it again. This is a small dongle that has a chip that is compatible with the the chip uh, from the dongle and makes it for me pretty easy to send uh, packets in a way that I want to. And let's try this. And as you can see, doing nothing. Well, as we expected, it's it's not that hard. So this is just uh, for demonstration. I can use PowerShell or whatever to, to download and execute whatever I want. And, and this is pretty fast, not like the mouse spoofing from before. Um, so what we do when we insert a presentation clicker dongle uh, is basically inputting in an, an full keyboard that everyone can control here in the room, so that's why I will unplug it now. Uh, the, the tool is already available on GitHub, so you can check it out if you want to. So you can try this at home with your own keyboard, not your neighbor's keyboard. At least in Germany, that's not legal. Um, what What is, if we're not talking about presenters, but about keyboards, and there are better keyboards out there. There are keyboards that claim to be AES encrypted, secure, and not everyone can control them that easy. In 2016, we found out that the at least the three down below uh, had a cryptographic issue in the way they used the AES counter mode that allowed us to inject valid keys, even though we did not use know the actual AS key, the AS encryption key. But we still were able to craft valid packets um, that we can inject into the communication and take over the remote system. However, that was not true for the Fujitsu keyboard. Uh, that was not, um, we tried the same vulnerability on that. It has a completely different chip. There was not the same. Uh, vulnerability in this device. But as we had a closer look, well, as you can see down below in the, in, in the picture, they have a two chip set up as well, and there's the wireless transceiver chip. And we had a closer look at the wireless transceiver chip and how it works. And like most of the manufacturers of wireless transceiver chips, they are publishing data sheets, and not only data sheets, in most cases, some example code, some SDK, or something to get you started. Well, because the chips are from Cypress, and the keyboard is from Fujitsu, uh, the developers at Fujitsu have it more easy. They can use the example code and modify it, or whatever they want. And in the example code, there was an example of a basic unencrypted keyboard, just to demonstrate you can do that with this chip. 
And so we made an assumption. What if the Fujitsu people just used that example code, added the encryption to the code, and what if they, well, forget to remove the, the unencrypted keyboard functionality in that code? And so we sniffed the communication between to understand more how the RF chip is initialized. And then we can build our own system. This is just another board. It's actually from, from controlling quadcopters for hobbyists. But it has the, the Cypress chip here. Um, this is a four in one transceiver. So under, beneath that metal shield, there are four transceivers. And one of them is the exact same transceiver we have in the Fujitsu keyboard. So it's, we just use this board because it has the compatible transceiver. And what we did is we re-implemented basically the example code that did exactly to the specification of the um, controller. Uh, inject a key that is, well, just an unencrypted A or an encrypted B keystroke. Of course, the keyboard is expecting encrypted keys, but what if we just well, pretend we don't have any encryption and send the unencrypted package? And it turned out it worked pretty well. So we have uh, just sent unencrypted keys instead of encrypted keys, and we can again take over the the system with the secure AES encrypted keyboard. I have brought this stuff here with me. The firmware is available online as well. It's just another quick demo. Um, so this one has a has a um, small microcontroller on the back side. Uh, so the attack is not like with the crazy radio on my computer. Everything is on there. So it's a standalone device. Also neat. Let me quickly connect the power supply. Let's try this. One. Second. Oh, no. Hmm. Interesting. I did check it uh, well, an hour ago, but maybe, like I said, the one, well, like I said before, um, it's too crowded here with RF signals, so the demo will not work. Yeah, hmm. maybe it doesn't. Sorry about that, but that's how it is with live demos. Try it one more time. No, sorry about that. Not working. Maybe it's uh, the Fujitsu keyboard does some channel hopping, and maybe because the area here is real crowded, it decided to go on a different channel. And this board is uh, well, basically hard coded to a, to a, a fixed channel. Uh, but the the demo is the same as before. Uh, you will see that you can enter um, Windows key and R and PowerShell or whatever to remotely take over the computer. So this is possible as well. There even is a YouTube video if you want to watch it. We uploaded it as demonstration. So. After we looked at the LX901, this is the keyboard well, I just tried to attack, uh, people asked us about the LX390 keyboard, another keyboard by Fujitsu that from the advertisement says it's a secure 2.4 gigahertz technology, not mentioning any AES encryption, but well, interesting enough, we wanted to have a closer look. So this is the data sheet, and on the top is the data sheet before we had a closer look, and below is the data sheet after we had a closer look and talked to Fujitsu 
Not sure if anyone can spot it. The font is really tiny. Here's the difference. <laughs> so it's, it's first that with secure 2.4 technology, and after that, um, they just changed it to 2.4 technology. They, they told us it's uh, more or less a translation error because in Germany there are not the, the word security is it's, it's the same security and safety is the same word and sometimes even reliability gets confused with that and in Germany you can what at least that's what they told us what they meant with secure they meant a more reliable connection not sure so just uh, going through that keyboard quick to understand what we did there. It was a harder one, so it was the covered blobs, but we could sniff the communication, uh, reconstruct this is just a SPI communication, and by what we saw, how the microcontroller talked to the RF chip, we can reconstruct, um, well, we can look for data sheets, we can look for, for some information online of chips that are, well, set up in the same way because if you power up the keyboard there's at first a setup sequence like what channel to use uh, what uh, speed do you want to use and we looked at that and found out it's underneath there must be some kind of lt8900 based rf transceiver with that knowledge we can look at the data sheet of this device and decode the the packets that are sent over the air properly so after that, we know when we press a keyboard, uh, a key on that keyboard, um, we know everything that is going over the air. We have our packet format again. There are some some stuff we still need to understand to to break this secure keyboard. The first one is data scrambling. So this is this data whitening we had before. Uh, turns out, as I said down below, they use the same data scrambling on all devices. As I said, the data scrambling can be referred as keystream because we have to know it in order to decrypt or in order to in inject our own package. But since it's all the same for all keyboards, uh, we can just buy one, um, go through all keys, and if we have the sequence for all the keys that are on the keyboard, we can decrypt any other keyboard. And another interesting part for a keystroke injection is the, the CRC. As you can see, there are two keyboards here, and the CRC, the last part, is different for both of the keyboards, although the actual payload, the key A, is the same. Um, it's not a, a secure thing like a message authentication code, um, it's just a, a CRC. So we have to break this first. Um, you can, a CRT 16 is, if it's not too complicated, easily brute forcible. Um, so this is just for the sake of completeness, the polynomial, it's a reverse bit order. Um, but the interesting part, it has a device specific initialization value. So there's one byte that we have to know in order to compute the CRC correctly. But well, it's, it's one byte. You sniff, well, just record the packets in the air and you sniff one of the packages and then you brute force all the initialization bytes, and if you found the one that is coming to the same CRC, you have your initialization bit for this device. So to conclude, this keyboard was not secure. We can do replay attacks, we can do keystroke injection attacks, and even we can do sniffing, so my colleague at I don't think he has published it yet, but he wrote a key sniffer for this keyboard as well. Since we all can reconstruct all parameters for this keyboard, we can actually do a full sniffer. And if you go to your office and you have the keyboard and you log in into the into your machine in the morning, somewhere in, uh, in proximity of the of the keyboard, can sniff the communication and get your password. So. Some conclusion. First of all, um, 
basically everything we talked about was possible. So there are, we still can do mouse spoofing. We can um, do keystroke injections. We can even sniffing. Well, we can sniffing easily for those keyboards and those presenters that are not encrypted. But we actually found some cryptographic issues like in the last keyboards that allows us to sniff the communication because it was not secured properly. Um, we can do replay attacks for most of the devices, so it's really hard to find a device that is not vulnerable. Um, in a more comprehensive way for the different devices, we analyzed these were the presenters. Um, interesting enough, there's still one presenter where we were not able to do keystroke injection. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I won't recommend that device. Maybe it's still somehow exploitable, but we didn't find any security issue so far. But the, the overall outcome is not that good, even for, this is Mark Newland's research uh, on presenters. And as you can see, well, this is always from the attacker perspective, so green means good in, in the case of we can hack it. Um, and he could do keystroke injection attacks on all of these devices. Mouse spoofing worked on all of these devices as well. Um, the difference is just uh, their red axis somehow because um, some of the devices are, do not have a, a mouse. And to going back to our previously research from the AS super secure keyboards, we now have more closure on the Fujitsu keyboard because we know um, it actually is attackable with keystroke injection as well, like the other keyboards we found so far. So, some small recommendation. First of all, choose your wireless input device wisely. Your presenter even more, because in presenters there's basically no security so far. We, at least for now, maybe the future products will be better. And um, we recommend do, uh, to not use these device in, in an environment that has higher security demands. So if you have it in a high security area or uh, maybe the CEO or something important has a wireless desktop set, maybe just like, like the last point on this slide, if you're in doubt, maybe just, just switch it with a, an, an wired device that's just more secure. Um, what you can consider is Bluetooth-based wireless input devices. So all of these devices had, had nothing to do with Bluetooth. Bluetooth wireless devices tend to be more secure. Um, I wouldn't say that everything is secure there, uh, especially on the pairing process. Uh, in the initial pairing process, if you have an attacker close by and he's um, passively sniffing the pairing process, um, he can decrypt the communication afterwards, at least for the presenters we checked that had Bluetooth and for the keyboards. Um, that might change in the future, but if you really want to be secure, just use a wire. And then sometimes you even can update the devices, especially for Logitech devices. They, you can update the firmware of your dongle and, and your keyboard, at least for some products. That might ha help because they fixed some of the security issues, or maybe not really fixed, but mitigated the risk. So if you want to give this a try yourself, uh, Mark Newlin released all his tools about the wireless presenter research on GitHub. Marcus Mengs, you might be familiar with that. Uh, he did a lot of research this year on Logitech devices, and he wrote tools to exploit the, the uh, vulnerabilities he, he found. And the tools are also available on GitHub. And of course, uh, the tools I use here and we used in our research are also publicly available on our GitHub account. So you can give it a try for all these uh, different devices. So just a little bit of time, just for the fun of it. Um, some anecdotes. This was the AES encrypted Cherry keyboard we analyzed in 2016. And interesting enough, they fixed the security issue by, well, 
rebranding the product. They do not claim the, the keyboard to be secure anymore, and therefore they have no security issues. So they <laughs> give the keyboard a rebranding, and now it's no longer called B Unlimited IES. It's now called B Unlimited 3.0, so a new version, but uh, it actually has the same security issue that we found in 2016. So this is, well, not that hard, uh, not that easy for customers to understand that when they buy a newer version of the keyboard and the previous version had a, a known security issue, it's still there. And another interesting anecdote, even if you decide to buy a, a secure presenter or something like this, this is something that could happen to you as well. At least it happened to us. This is a Logitech R400 presenter. We uh, bought them on Amazon on different times in different versions. Not, not really versions. It's all the same R400 presenter. But when it arrived at us and we opened it up, we found three d completely different uh, hardware designs. They're completely different chips in there. There could be completely different security issues with there. So if you buy a secure presenter, you can be sure if it's a secure presenter when it arrives at you and you didn't have a look, closer look at it. And interesting enough, we asked Logitech about that. Are these fake devices, are they, because they are cheaper sometimes and they are lighter if you have them in your hand. Um, but Logitech said, oh, well, we, we cannot answer you if this is a fake or a real pre uh, presenter because all the parts in our presenters are copyright protected. So uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a cheap Chinese reprint or they changed the manufacturing process, uh, process to cheaper chips. And one more interesting thing, it never gets, well, never gets boring with this wireless input devices. We bought some of uh, one of these devices, haven't had the time to look into it closer, but maybe in the future we come up with another security advisory because these wireless barcode scanners are just keyboards as well in a different form factor. So the slides will be online. Here are the references for you. And if you want to have a look at it, and if we still maybe some minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, first of all, for attending to the talk and your interest into it. Try it at home. And if you have any question now or I will be there for the whole conference if you want to talk to me as well. Thank you. <laughs>